starting here with Dr. Paul. So I want to go back to the um, Los Angeles Times analogy we started out with. And specifically, um, I would assume, and I, would, I can't say for sure, that the editors of the Los Angeles Times did not consider the possibility of um, God or space alien or what have you having done the photoshopping. And the reason is that we know how Photoshop works. And we know how a person might go about manipulating Photoshop. And furthermore, we know what types of motives somebody might have to try and get a Pulitzer Prize and whatever the motive happened to be. So the analogy breaks down if you use a little bit. And the reason is that we're dealing with a situation in which <clears throat> the analogies that you're using involve situations where we actually know a great deal about the intelligent agents. Um, so why then do the LA Times editors not consider God as a mechanism of photoshopping? And why didn't the FBI consider God as a mechanism of bringing down the airplane that you mentioned? And so on. Why is it that... When in my, when in my presentation did I use the noun God? You did catch it. Okay, there's a reason for the favor. There's a reason for the favor. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was a glimpse behind the curtain, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's from Thomas Brown, uh, Religio Medici, great 18th century work on natural history. Um, let me put it this way. You, my view of scientific explanation is you look for the best explanation. Obviously, in the case of the LA Times, the best explanation was the guy was trying for a Pulitzer. What they didn't do after they exhausted a very short list of natural candidates is throw out their hands and say, yeah, we've got a puzzle, but you know what? Agency's off the, off the docket. It's not, it's not a candidate cause. What you can get with the data of biology, I think, is an inference to an intelligent cause. The identity of that, intelligence, character, one, many, teenager, flying spaghetti monster, who knows? <laughs> Those are... Yeah. The... <laughs> um, they the sauce be with you, thank you. <laughs> um, Those are questions you're going to have to bring more to the table to resolve. And, I, and in the opening remarks, I, I think it was Antonio said that philosophy and science actually Interfinger. He didn't use that verb, but that's the one that I like. And I would say that, that you can get to the generic intelligence, but the sorts of questions about transcendent, mundane, those are open. Fred Boyle, the great British astronomer, was an atheist. But in the 1980s, he wrote two books arguing vigorously for the intelligent design of life on the basis of DNA, informational bearing patterns in DNA, and saying that natural causes were in he argued, in principle, insufficient to explain what we observe. An atheist arguing for intelligent design. So I would say, cut these ideas free from the socio-political mess that we're currently in, and let's see what we can do with this notion of intelligent causation. We'll sort out the philosophical puzzles later. Um, I wanted to, to learn your reaction to Paul uh, Nelson's um, implication that there is a um, unwritten code of conduct within the biological sciences as somebody who came into biology uh, through the philosophical uh, route. Um, is there such a... a an unwritten uh, rule that uh, people not, uh, I, I people must behave within the science, otherwise they are uh, out of science? Um, I'm not sure exactly what was what Paul intended to say, but in some sense, of course, there's a rule that governs all scientific conduct and all expectation in the sense that you're, you follow the proper peer review process, your experiments are done in such a way that they can be replicated, and things of that sort. There's sort of, but if, if a more extreme claim is being made that there's some sort of a conspiracy that goes on to prevent evolutionary theory from being questioned, 
within the biological community there clearly isn't. I mean, there have been critiques within. There have been tons of times when people have suggested that some fundamental aspect of, 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 of evolutionary theory happens to be wrong. And lots and lots of people have tried to show, tried, tried to show that that is true. The most recent one I remember is from about 15 years ago when there were reports that certain mutations in bacteria were directed, that is, they were more likely to occur in environments in which they were favorable than in environments where, where, where they were not immense amount of experimental work was generated. So what you have at the end of the day is a standard scientific process of peer review, repeatable experiments and all of that, and it just happens to be the case that till now, evolutionary theory has survived all of those fine, and the creationist opponents have not presented a detailed enough model for us even to play the game of evaluating how we could stack up against the evidence. Yes, let me ask you a question to Professor Nelson. Uh, sort of a, an alternative aspect of me broadly methodological naturalism and your views on it. Uh, again, the piece you presented us with today, uh, the, the, the participants, that is, you cite an advantage of allowing intelligent design sorts of explanations uh, and that you say there's no advantage, none, to confronting the world with a smaller toolkit of possible causes. It is, you know, why not have this extra sort of explanation in one's toolkit when explaining rings of Saturn or whatever, you know, the orbitals of uranium or what have you. I think that's highly misleading, and I'll ask for a response when I describe why. Because as Professor Bolnick was saying, Everyone has a finite time. We have to make our best judgment as to what sorts of hypotheses to pursue. So it's not at all cost free to go, you know, go off, a hundred of our best scientists go off and research red alienism. It just, I have to say, in my view, that would be a complete waste of very scarce resources. And one might feel similarly about other, a design, proposal that's as vague as the one that you have seem to have in mind, in which you say it's a struggle to articulate a view of life that makes sense of the long run, some unsolved problems in the naturalistic program, that's one virtue it's supposed to have, and then it illuminates organisms for what they really are, and then leads to discoveries unanticipated under any naturalistic model. Now it seems to me the supposed virtue A makes sense of long unsolved problems. I don't see as much of a virtue, given the vagueness of the proposal, the indeterminacy, because again, as Sohotra pointed out, we have no handle on any of the pro relevant properties, such as the intentions of the supposed intelligence. So all we have, it's about as good as the following magical explanation. Magical law caused life to exist. I mean, you can say, well, that explains why there's life, right? Magical law produced it. Well, but it's not a very illuminating or interesting explanation. So it's yet another vice of the sort of research program you suppose, you propose. And then the third one, I'll, I'll skip the second one. I don't know what that means to organisms what they really are, but the third one leads to discoveries that I anticipate. I mean, you've already granted that no such, nothing of that sort's on the table after, I don't know, millennia of attempts. So I'll let you respond to that. 